Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for dropping in and a uh, special part welcome to folks that are here in the Zoom room. Lovely to see you. And uh, a real appreciation and for folks that may be practicing with us after the fact. Um, I hope you find something of, of service and support in these teachings tonight. Um, yeah, so this is uh, a teaching from a book that um, is called Older and Wiser. Uh, classical Buddhist teachings on aging, sickness, and death. And in the YouTube recording down below, I'll put a link to this book so you can check it out. And um, this section is called Beyond Joy and Sorrow. Uh, an interesting title. And it's uh, from the Samyutta Nikaya for people that like to follow along in suttas, the Samyutta Nikaya 2.28. So that is just a title of a collection of teachings written down from the oral tradition of the Buddhist time. And this is a short little conversation um, between the Buddha and um, someone named Kakadua. Kakuda. Let me see. Kakuda. Yes. So it's K-A-K-U-D-D-H-A. -D -D so it looks like Buddha at the end. Kakuda. That sounds right. Yes. Kakuda. Um, and so this person, uh, late at night, the Buddha was in seclusion, and uh, this uh, Kakuda visited him with some questions. And this following conversation, it's kind of poetic um, exchange occurred between them. And so Kakuda says, are you delighted, wanderer? He's addressing the Buddha who's there in meditation. He's a wanderer, meaning he's left home and is um, and a practicing monastic life. He asks him, are you delighted? And the Buddha replies, what is it, friend, that I've received? Hmm. And he, so the Kakuda says, are you grieving, wanderer? What is it, friend, that I have lost? He replies. Kuda says, is it then, wanderer, that you're neither delighted nor grieving? Friend, it is just so, he replies. Kuda says, I hope that you don't tremble, monk, since no delight is to be found. I hope that you can sit alone without being consumed by regret. And the Buddha says, indeed, I do not tremble so, uh, since I'm consumed with no delight. And so it is, I sit alone without being consumed, consumed by regret. How is it you don't tremble, monk? How, how is it no delight is found? How is it that you sit alone without being consumed by regret? And the Buddha says, delight only follows distress. Distress only follows delight. Neither delighted nor distressed, friend, this is how to know a monk. And Kakuda says in closing, at long last I see a Brahmin whose fires are fully quenched, a monk neither delighted nor distressed, who has traversed the world's attachments. So this, this reference here, mm, to whose fires are fully quenched, this is a phrase that means in Sanskrit what is called nirvana. In the Pali language that this is coming from, it would be nibbana. Nibbana and nirvana or nibbana 
literally translated means the fires are extinguished. The fires of desire, the fires of wanting and not wanting, particularly the fires of becoming. And that's what nirvana means. Nirvana, it means these fires are extinguished. It means the full awakening of an enlightened being, a Buddha. There, and so you can hear, hear this quality, uh, um, you know, that neither delighted nor distressed, there's no wanting, there's no not wanting, there's no trembling, there's a real steadiness. Um, traverse the world's attachments. So this might, uh, to us, to me, seems highly aspirational and not how most my days are experienced. And so I want to distinguish the, this equanimity, it's called, or upeka in Pali. Um, there's a, mm, the attainment of equanimity that is of, of an enlightened being, a Buddha, that is beyond sorrow and distress. And there is an equanimity that is maybe more relatable or accessible for us, something we can cultivate that is within the sorrows and the distress and the desires within this worldly life, within these waves of gain and loss, pain, um, I should have looked these up again, the vicissitudes before I started, but um, praise and blame, gain and loss, pain and pleasure, and fame and disrepute. I did it. <laughs> Thank you, Micah, you were sending that. And uh, <laughs> uh, so the you know, we can name them any number of dyads, these waves of life. Oh, things are good. Things are not good. I like it. I don't like it. Um, I'm happy. I'm not happy. Um, you know, most of us experience these waves through our days, many times in a day, perhaps. And sometimes they feel like tsunamis, really big waves. Uh, and, okay, so, the, the teachers that are, um, in this, uh, commentary of this book are reflecting, particularly, their, um, this book is written in the context of aging, sickness, and death, and so they're talking about some of the wisdom that comes from experience, we hope, <laughs> that maybe we spent a lot of years trying really hard to get things how we want them to be. And we try to, we spend a lot of energy and a lot of money and a lot of time attaining and, you know, creating uh, the world that we desire and getting rid of what we don't want and um, working so hard at that. And at some point we get glimmers, glimpses of no understanding that's not the path to peace, to happiness, to equanimity. Um, and we start to perhaps cultivate some contentment Contentment is our capacity to be content with how things are, content with what is offered. So there's a quality of contentment, which is a little bit different, they're related, than equanimity. Equanimity is an even-mindedness, a steadiness of heart-mind in the face of every sort of experience. 
that regardless if it's painful or pleasant, regardless if it's how we want it or how we don't want it, there's some even-mindedness, some ability to be unflustered, uh, some ability to see clearly and respond wisely. Um, the the uh, one of the commentators here, Gloria Tarania Ambrosia, um, says that this equanimity is born out of wisdom of seeing for ourselves that the longing and resisting do not bring about the desired result. This is a, such an important insight, you know, the longing, the wanting and the not wanting, longing and resisting, they, they're not getting us what we want. You know, and, and it, it, it may be that, you know, it's really wise action, we might be able to uh, have some impact in how how things are, but if we look closely, we'll see that we have much less control than we think with how things are, how other people are, <laughs> way less control over that than we think, how the world is, how politics are, how the weather is, on and on how our health is, our aging, yeah, and, and uh, you know, we may have spent a lot of time and energy thinking, if I can get this or get rid of this, then I will be happy. And as was said here, even in the, in the sutta, um, Delight only follows distress. Distress only follows delight. That delight and distress are two sides of the same coin. The same coin. Wanting, not wanting. Part of our conditioning in uh, this westernized consumerized culture is that maybe that equanimity is kind of boring like we're used to the highs and lows we're used to the excitement we're used to the drama we're used to the endorphins of getting what we want or and and um and andrew Olensky says here um that equanimity is not boring or bland, but that, as he quote, an unencumbered by the emotional highs and lows, the mind is capable of a remarkable clarity and immediacy. So when the mind is not consumed, encumbered by these highs and lows, the delights and distresses of that same coin, then the mind, heart mind, the aware heart is capable of remarkable clarity and immediacy, respondability, profound well being, um, not boring or bland, really. joyful and peaceful. Uh, one of my favorite parts of this commentary comes from Musong, who, and my apologies to you, Mu, if I am mispronouncing your name. Uh, their last name is S-O-E-N-G, first name M-U, Mu Song. Uh, Actually, she's quoting Bhikkhu Bodhi at first. Bhikkhu Bodhi describes this mind state of equanimity, which I had never heard this before, and I love it very much. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi describes this mind state as a considering mind. I hadn't come across that before. Considering mind is an equanimous mind. That's 
so interesting to me because we could see the opposite of that like a considering mind is like hmm it could be this way it could be that way I'm not you know not knowing reflecting on what are the conditions of how something arose considering its impermanence considering is it something to cling to or or certainly not and so it's the opposite of a prejudice mind which is a mind that's made it has been made up you've made up your mind I am this way, they they are that way, it is this way, it's going to be that way, you know, I like it, I don't like it, I want it, I don't want it. That's a prejudice mind. It's not open to seeing different views. Um, and so this, this equanimous mind or equanimity as a considering mind, I find that helpful. Um, and they go on, this type of mind is pliable. It's uh, not rigid. It's, um, but also stable. But these sound, these are interesting to me. Pliable, but also stable. Um, flexible. And reached a state of not fluttering. That's so good. Not fluttering that steadiness but still fluid so pliable and flexible there's a fluidity but it's not a fluttery not fluttering uh and they actually have the poly words for these which is very exciting not fluttering um yeah So what's very important here is the, mm, the importance of recognizing when we've had a glimpse, <laughs> because we've all experienced equanimity. We have all known times or periods or moments of not fluttering mind or, yeah, times of, of considering and fluidity, flexibility, presence. It, it's also characterized by um, a concentrated mind without blemish, purified and cleansed. Um, there's lots of other descriptive words, but I, I like uh, not fluttering and uh, considering mind. Uh, so for us to really recognize and acknowledge these little ways, maybe glimpses, times, when we are actually experiencing freedom. It takes quite an intention to recognize it and to see how it feels in the body, heart, mind. Moments of steadiness, of presence, of equilibrium in the midst of all the waves. Um, the peace of not wanting is another phrase here. Okay, so I don't want to say too much more, but to yeah, just point out the, this is possible for us, and maybe it's possible for some to attain a, a Buddhist state of equanimity. Um, it certainly is possible for all of us to attain, experience, develop, and grow more capacity for equanimity within the comings and goings of life. And one of the ways we do that is with uh, upeka practice. So equanimity as a practice is one of the Brahma Viharas, the heart abode practices, the cultivation of equanimity. It's a 
it's like um, cultivation is like a seed in the garden. We all have this within us and we want to recognize it and to cultivate it to help it grow. Uh, and so this can be done through uh, the practice we're going to do tonight. What else? Um, anything else? Yeah. There's near, what's called near and far enemies of these states. Uh, and the far enemy is something that's its opposite. So the far enemy of equanimity would be craving and clinging, that, that coin that we're talking about. Both sides of the coin, craving and clinging. When we're attached, either holding on or pushing something away, we're attached. And this is the cause of dukkha. Um, and so that's the opposite of equanimity. The near enemy is something that sometimes seems like it. It's really close. It's it's a it's important to discern the difference because we can slip into these and think we're being equanimous. And the near enemy is indifference, where we think which is kind of like spiritual bypassing, like, oh, it's all fine. It's all just coming and going. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> or what was it someone said this morning? Um, oh, I can't quite catch the phrase, but it was a common phrase that people use of, well, neither here nor there. That kind of, that's almost like an, that indifference, just shrugging it off, saying, oh, well, everything comes and goes, and it's a, there's a resignation in it. Um, and also apathy is a near enemy of um, not engaging with life, not engaging with how things are. And so actually this quality of equanimity allows us to meet how it is and to be steady in the midst of it. So a oh, heartache is here, attending to the heartache, what's needed, paying attention, being skillful with our actions and speech, or anger is here, or exuberance is here, whatever the state. It's not riding above it on a little cloud of white sparkly lights even though I have white sparkly lights behind me. So let's do this practice and um, cultivate this quality. All right. <clears throat> so it can be helpful to really find some steadiness in your posture. <clears throat> You might like to get a little bit wider with your, your seat or with your legs. Uh, you could also practice this standing and kind of let the body move a little bit and until you find a sense of center. And once you find your posture, letting yourself really drop down like a plumb line, down through the spine into the weight of the sacrum and the pelvis. Take some time to just 
Let the body settle into the posture. Checking into any tension in the habit places of the body. And inviting some softness. Some space. And as the upper body relaxes, we may begin to feel more weightedness through the lower half of the body, or if you're laying down through the back body. And then when you're ready, we'll just begin with a few minutes of watching the breath. Really lightly, spaciously, softly. Just knowing breath is coming and going. And even as these breaths come and go, we can feel a sense of steadiness that's with the coming and going. And you might notice in some moments, awareness picks up on one of those waves of thought that comes through and starts to travel away with it. At some point we notice and gently come back to resting with the waves of breath. And now we'll invite in a positive intention, Sankalpa, that we are doing this practice to make our own lives meaningful 
and beneficial for ourselves and others. So just with your own words or with those words, let that settle into your heart awareness why you're doing this practice. And then with this practice of equanimity, it has this sense of center point between the extremes of joy and sorrow, between the extremes of liking and disliking. So we're going to begin the practice with what's called a neutral person. So we bring into our heart, mind, awareness, Somebody that you, you barely know. It may be a stranger or someone you even don't know their name, but you kind of see them fairly often. And that you don't have strong feelings for them one way or another. Kind of a, a neutral person for you. And don't struggle over who should I choose, but just let whatever comes into awareness be the person to stand in for all those who are neutral. You could kind of have an image of them or felt experience, a sense of where you regularly see them. And then we begin cultivating this equanimity in relationship with others, with this neutral person. So you could repeat these phrases to yourself and then just reflect on it, feel it in your body. May you know the wisdom of enough. May you know contentment. May you cultivate steadiness amidst the waves. May you recognize glimpses of equanimity when they arise. May you settle into the peace of arising and passing. And then in this silence here, practicing with your own words, with this neutral person, or just with the felt sense of steadiness in these wishes with them.
And then in your heart mind, just closing that connection with the neutral person or bowing to them in your awareness. And reconnect, feeling with your own body right here and now. And feeling into what steadiness and ease is here present for you in this moment. And now we cultivate this quality, this wish, this felt experience within ourselves. May I know the wisdom of enough. May I know contentment. May I cultivate steadiness amidst the waves of life. May I recognize the glimpses of the quantumous mind and heart when they arise. May I release the struggle to control circumstances. And then some time of silence here to cultivate your own words, your own wishes, felt experience in your own heart, mind, body, to cultivate equanimity. Recognizing how it feels in the body to find some steadiness, presence, unfluttered mind. And 
And even if there is disturbance in heart, mind, or body, bringing some heart steadiness with that in the midst of it. And as Sharon Salzberg says, seeing that the universe is much too big to hold on to, but it is the perfect size for letting go, our hearts and minds can become that big and we can actually let go. So letting ourselves trust that we don't need to do this we don't need to make it we don't have to figure it out but trust the universe is the perfect size for letting go letting our awareness be known in a really spacious way so feeling now beyond our own hearts and bodies feel the space of the room. Feel the space outside of the room. Awareness of your community. Let that be as wide in all directions as possible without figuring it out or thinking about it, just letting go. And opening to the awareness of the oneness of all life. May all beings know the wisdom of enough. May all beings know contentment. May all beings cultivate steadiness amidst the waves of life. May all beings recognize the glimpses of equanimity when they arise. And then resting with your own words, your own felt experience of cultivating this wise heart with all beings everywhere, including ourselves.
beings everywhere. No steadiness, even-mindedness. open-heartedness within the waves of life. So thank you to those who joined our practice um, on YouTube. Check the link below for the book reference and uh, hope to share practice with you again sometime.